Kate, I am so excited about what I ate last night. Can I tell you? Yes. From 7 o'clock on, I ate nothing. I was so excited and I felt so good. I went to bed with a light stomach and I woke up with a light stomach and I thought, wow, I should have medical tests more often that make me fast the night before. That's what I thought. (laughs) I literally thought if I could just somehow schedule an exam every day what's that disease what's that disease when someone like is like addicted to like medical treatments you know what i'm talking about oh yeah munchausen syndrome perhaps yeah i mean that's a solution to things (laughs) that sounds like a good one so i didn't actually get to eat anything last night (laughs) it was a hard (laughs) night oh ricky i'm sure you'll make up for it (laughs) (laughs) no doubt Hello, and welcome to the very first podcast of You Won't Believe What I Ate Last Night. I am Kate DeVore. And I am Rick Fiore. And this is our ongoing conversation about food, weight management, and our endeavor to be and stay healthy in a really tasty world. Because this is our first podcast, we really want your feedback. So we're going to give you some more information at the end of the show about how you can give us that feedback. Here's what we've got today. Meditation. What is it? Why is it useful in relation to food intake and weight management? We've got a simple technique that you can start using immediately. So I've been thinking, Rick, about the idea of what is necessary in order to get back on the wagon when I fall off the wagon and what works to motivate me back into healthy habits and behaviors. Because for years and years, I went to the gym religiously every day, six or seven days a week for one to two hours a day. And people would be like, oh, my God, how do you motivate to do that? And I could never explain because it was never a challenge. It was something I loved and it was easy and it wasn't a, it wasn't a chore. It was it was a part of my life that I actually actively loved and enjoyed. So it was never difficult. And then after seven years of that, I guess they talk about the seven-year itch in relationships, right? I guess Uh, seven years is a cycle for stuff. So after seven years, it stopped being so great. And there was other factors that stopped too. I had an injury, the staff changed in the classes that I took, and it wasn't as motivating, you know, so there were other changes too, but the fact remained it stopped. And I was like, huh, I actually don't know how to motivate myself to go to the gym because I hadn't had to before. And then similarly with eating. For years, I was eating really healthily, generally, still, you know, having my exceptions and going out and having one day a week where I would blow it at least and on purpose and all that. Um, And then the slippery slope happened and I got back into really bad habits and I thought, geez, how do I motivate myself to actually change these habits again? So I sat for a couple of months in this space of eating and drinking too much and poorly and not going to the gym enough or eventually at all and not finding a way out and being really puzzled and challenged by how to get back there. And what I think the answer for me is that brings everything together is meditation or something resembling meditation, even if it isn't exactly meditation. And I think the reason that works is because... We get so hung up, it seems, on figuring out the answers to things and solving challenges that that we really don't know the answers to and can't solve, and so we can get stuck in that. And I think that for me, and I I believe for other, many other people, I'm sure not everybody, but certainly for a lot of people that I know, getting back into a space where I hear my inner guidance, you know, that what they call the still small voice, right, of the wise part of ourselves. When I can hear that, when I feel like I'm really present and I'm being mindful and I am focused on what I'm doing in the moment, then the answers to those kinds of challenging questions are able to reveal themselves. So for me, it's about finding a still centered space and doing the emotional or psychological work that sometimes comes along with that that enables me to create a basic energy pattern that um, leads to a positive behavior pattern without it really being effortful. Um, What are your thoughts on that? Do you have any such similar experiences? I would agree with you 100%. Yes. How handy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, because I would also say that 
whenever I've been the most consistent, it's always related in the last several years to a very strong meditation practice. And the whole idea of, like you said, being able to turn in and really just get clear, right, on what you want and what's important to you. And therein, I think this is why it's so crucial in relation to your whole concept about mo uh, motivation, because what motivates us is what we want, right? Our desires, those cravings that pull us. That's what motivates us to go to the store. That's what motivates us to cook a meal. That's what motivates us to pick a restaurant. So, yeah, I think the two are so intrinsically tied together because you can't have motivation without a moment at any point where you're really able to be clear on what it is, your desire is, what you want so I think it's really great. I just think that whole thing about being able to close your eyes and really just like shut off the voices, there's nothing more powerful to me than that. How often do you do it, would you say? Well, it depends. When I, uh, for a while I was doing it every day and now it's uh, a little bit less frequent than that. I think there's also a lot of different versions of meditation. I don't think it necessarily has to be sitting down with my eyes closed for 20 minutes. Yeah. There are times that I can kind of tap into that space when I'm walking, for example, or when I'm, if I'm on the elliptical or doing some kind of rhythmic movement. I know runners can sometimes find that to be meditative. So there's places that I do maybe more non-traditional ones, or I might even check in for really, truly just like 30 seconds or so. I might find that I just have a minute, even on the subway or something mm -hmm. like that, that yeah. I really kind of just go inward and uh, find a different um, perspective. And I think it's also interesting because we've talked before about comfort food and, and the need for comfort in this. And I think that's where a lot of the bad choices for me come from is that I find them comforting in the moment, short term. Yeah. And I think that when I am regu regularly meditating enough that I am generally in that space of being present for most right. of my day, yeah. then I don't have the need for comfort in that external way. Right. So I think it's about how do we eliminate the need for the things that draw us into bad behaviors as opposed to how do we discipline ourselves not to have those bad behaviors, which yeah, is yeah, a totally yeah. different perspective. Yeah, 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 totally. And with the whole meditation idea, it's really that whole concept of what you were sort of talking about earlier is how does that become the thing that has an ongoing pattern? How is that a pattern of familiarity, being able to sit down, close your eyes and really be clear? you know, on what's going on inside. And that's what's sort of hard because on another level for me, it can be off to become just one more thing that I have to get done during the day, right? Just, oh my mm -hmm. gosh, now you're telling me I have to sit down and think about what I want. But yeah, unfortunately I do. For me and probably for you, or I think we're the type of people that, yeah, that's how we're made up, that we have to do that, that it has to come on a daily basis. Yeah, I have to do something. And sometimes it's more structured. Sometimes I'll repeat a word or a phrase over and over again, a mantra. Sometimes I'll use the mantra that I was given when I was taught TM, Transcendental Meditation. Sometimes I'll just pick a different word. Um, and how do you describe mantra? A mantra is a word or phrase that has some kind of calming effect generally speaking. So the one I was given for, for Transcendental Meditation, I don't even know what it means. I think it's a Sanskrit word. It might even be made up. I don't know. And I can't ask anyone because you're not allowed to tell anyone what your mantra is. So they, <laughs> it could be a whole scam. I don't know, actually. Um, but I know Herbert Benson really has funny. a book called um, The Relaxation Response, where he talks, he's a physician who ran the Mind Body Institute at Harvard for a long time. And he did a lot of research. They didn't call it meditation, but it was exactly meditation. And, and they would say to just choose a word or phrase that has some calming, peaceful, positive effect for you, like love or ocean mm. or one, or a phrase from a prayer if you're religious or something like that. So the idea is you just sit quietly for 10 to 20 minutes and repeat that word or phrase over and over again. And when other thoughts inevitably come into your mind, instead of being judgmental and feeling like you're failing at meditating, just knowing that that's going to happen and just passively go, oh, look, a thought, and then just go back to your word or phrase. So the whole point of the mantra or the word or phrase is to give your mind something to occupy itself so that it doesn't start running through your laundry list of things that need to happen. Um, and that's a that's a nice, simple way to, to start meditating, I think, for people that aren't familiar with it. Lately, I've been doing a different version, though, where I've been focusing on feeling my feelings. Mm. 
So I'll just sit down and close my eyes and be like, okay, what am I feeling emotionally right now? And then I'll go into that and I'll take some breaths where I really breathe that feeling in. Because I find that a lot of times I'm trying to resist what I'm feeling instead of embracing it. So by just feeling it, it tends to transform into something else. So that's been what a lot of mine has been like this month. But, you know, other times it might be something else. What I love about this idea of meditation is it's so the antithesis of where I am when I'm gorging or when I'm binging. Because mm. when I'm eating poorly or gorging or binging or eating more than I should, there's always this moment during or after where I'm like, how the hell did that just happen? Such a moment of non-present, right? Such a moment of not being aware of what it is you want or what it is you need or what it is you want to put in your body. So it's always such a fascinating concept to me, yeah. Totally. I think there's a whole movement of something called mindful eating, right? Which is yeah. about that whole idea of being totally mindful and present with every bite you take into your mouth. And every now and then I try that and it's exhausting. <laughs> it is exhausting. I mean, it's a lot to I tried ask. to get through a salad that way once and I was like, God, it's <laughs> really... Because I love to either be talking to somebody or if I'm by myself, I'll, I'll watch TV or even read sure. while I'm eating. I rarely just sit down and concentrate on my meal which I probably uh, would benefit from doing. This is the whole thing they say where like, even if you eat alone, that taking the time to set the table and make a really nice setting can be a meditation in and of itself that is going to force you to give yourself in your dinner the time and energy that it deserves and the attention that it deserves. But I'm with you. I'm like, I don't often have time. I'm lucky if I can finish the whole dish while I'm standing up in my kitchen eating. That's when I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. I I feel lucky if I can do that. So I think that for for most of us, when we're having trouble finding the the key or the door back in to a behavioral change, I think just instead of focusing so much on the behavioral change, I think there can be value potentially in focusing inward and getting centered and getting present Mm -hmm. and allowing the answer to emerge from that place rather than from the place of panic and fluff. Yeah, and plus that whole idea of sitting for a few minutes and really checking in. It's such an act of self-care and self-love, right? And I think that mm-hmm. more so than anything is going to, what's when you start to do that more often, right? To self-love mm-hmm. yourself more, to bring more attention to what's right for you. I think it's just going to help every part of your life and is naturally yep. going to like fold right into the whole how you eat and what you eat. Hey, Rick, did you know that a 20-ounce Coca-Cola has more sugar than a large Cinnabon? Get out. Are you serious? Hey, Rick, did you know that strawberries, raspberries, and blackberries are not actually berries? But bananas, tomatoes, pumpkins, watermelons, and avocados are actually all berries. Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. I know. So here's the thing that's interesting, Kate. I think it's so interesting that as much as we go through this journey, as much as we talk about our weight, weight loss, all those those things, I am completely fascinated how it always comes back to all the stuff I either already know, have already heard, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's just the degree to which I've heard those things or not heard those things. It's also the same thing, you know, when you, you know, sometimes when you're studying a subject and you go to a new teacher, a new teacher can say something to you that someone's been saying to you a hundred times over. Yeah. And you finally hear it and you're like, oh my God, that's the most amazing thing ever. And let me just say as a teacher, how much I love when that happens to my students, <laughs> when they're, when <laughs> there's something I've been teaching them forever. And then they finally come back and they're like, I learned the most amazing thing from so-and-so. It's like, oh, really? That's great. <laughs> it makes you feel very valued, doesn't yes, it? exactly. <laughs> yes. And effective. Although I know ultimately that, that, that seed needed to be planted plainly, but yeah. it is. It's always it's tough on my ego, and I always have to be like, oh, how great that so and so is such a brilliant teacher. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame I didn't have anything to do with it. Yeah, exactly. And it's that heavy it's that heavy lifting that's the hard work. It's yes. the heavy lifting before the realization, it's right? The sewing that of the field. No one recognizes. Yeah. yeah. And that even the person when they have the realization, it takes them a while. They have to be very keen to be able to put it together that the seed's been laid, it's been watered. It's been gardened with your fingers. That's right. right? So it could eventually sprout. Right. So I'm just sort of struck by that. And I just think it's this whole thing that is so interesting, right? Is can you just come back and realize on a weird level, right? That you know everything you're supposed to know. 
you know everything you know. The question is, can you create a space where you can implement it and put it into place? And can you create a space where all of your knowledge can just come to fruition, which is ultimately the challenge. And I was struck by what you said in our last conversation, how much more you've been meditating Mm. and how much, again, I say, creating the space to meditate and to think and to make yourself present in between all the crazy dynamics of life. It's such a huge key because it does allow all this stuff to settle and come back together. Yeah. I think Richard Bach said in Illusions, maybe, that uh, learning is discovering what you already know. Oh. (laughs) I know, I know. That's really beautiful. Remember Richard Bach? I do remember that book. He wrote Illusions. He also wrote one. I know he wrote many other things. Jonathan Livingston Siegel was his big hit, I think. Yes. Yeah. And we were so into those in college. I know, but Illusions was my favorite. I love Illusions. Yeah, I would do Illusions first, then Jonathan Livingston, Livingston Siegel, and then one after that. Yeah, I think so. Who wrote Way of the Peaceful Warrior? Is, did he write Dan that? Millman. Oh, Dan Millman, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Another good book. Yeah. Here's what we're practicing this week and hope that you will practice right along with us. Every day, take a minute. I mean, literally a minute. Take a couple of deep breaths and exhale fully and connect with yourself to become more present. Or take the challenge to sit quietly and mentally repeat a mantra for a few minutes every day. Next week, get your blenders out because we are talking about the power of smoothies. We really would love it if you would send us your thoughts on our first episode. You can send them to you won't believe what I ate at gmail.com. Thank you so much. Thanks.